some prime time? Well, if you're 50 and over, you are. You know, when you hit 50, nobody even recognizes you anymore. We just become invisible. And oftentimes, ageism creeps in even to the church. Sometimes we're neglected. Sometimes people think we're just too old, that we have no part in ministry, and God is done with us. But that's not true. David said, I was young, but now I'm old, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. That was his testimony. He grew up in God, grew old in the Lord, and yet he still had a place. So what we want to do is just get people together, 50 and over, if you'd like to hang out with us. And uh, we want to focus on three things. They call the three S's. Speak on a, particularly uh, deal with our spiritual life, deal with our social life, hang out, maybe go to Israel together. That'd be cool, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'd be on me too if you guys show up and uh, <laughs> in my dreams. And, and then service. You know, maybe we could do some things to radically change this community for Jesus. Wouldn't that be cool? At 65, 70, 80, or over 50. And uh, we even let some 40, 50 year olds, or maybe 40s, come every once in a while just to check us out. So I'm hoping you'll be a part of that. Pastor Aaron's gone, as you know. We need to pray for him as he's ministering probably today in the pulpit. So, Lord, be with him as we ask you to be with us. The other day, probably a couple of days ago, I ran into a woman who told me she was a widow. She just lost her husband. And before he passed, he was working for this job, and the company went out of business. Because he went out of business, he lost his life insurance. So here's a woman who has five kids, lost her husband, lost his income, lost his life insurance, then she lost her house, then her children moved out. Within three weeks of his death, for the first time since she was married, she found herself working. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear those stories and I'm talking with people like that, sometimes I wonder, what am I going to tell them? What should I tell them? What can I tell them? And oftentimes I'm kind of scared because I might say the wrong thing or say a stupid thing that really does more harm than good. Have you ever been there? Do you ever feel that way? Sometimes you just feel like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'd rather just stay away from them instead of getting in contact with them because I just really don't know what to say. Char and I were watching a program the other day and the program happened to be one that uh, a girl was murdered. Their daughter was murdered. It was a parent and uh, her family, parent, her parents, I should say, her mom and dad. And two brothers lost their daughter and they lost their uh, sister. And this woman was really having a, tri a trial working through this, and you can only appreciate it, even on this film. It, it was really depicting real life. It really was how people just really have a struggle when they lose a child. And she isolated herself. And finally, a friend said, why don't you just get out and go to the store? Just start life again as much as you can. And so she did. While she was at the market, she noticed a friend afar off by another aisle, and she began to wave, and the woman knew what she was going through and didn't bother to wave back. She just quickly left and went out the store. Why did she do that? Because most of us don't want to deal with people who've lost a loved one or gone through a terrible situation. We just don't know what to say. We want to say something. We want to be a blessing, but we're afraid that somehow we would do more harm than good. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt that way? Yeah, many of us have felt that way before. So... I want to talk about spiritual care this morning. If you have your Bibles, we want to look at the book of Job. We're a house. Because uh, I think many of us have had times struggling with what to say or do with people who have gone through a major crisis. And maybe you're one of them. There was a major crisis in my life a little while back. Well, in fact, it was years and years ago. We were teaching at a Bible college in Smartville, California, just outside of Marysville. While we were there, the senior leader of the group at that time was going to move on and start pastoring another church. So they asked Shar and I if we would consider taking it over. And we were honored to think that, that they would want us. Yes, we would want to be a part of that ministry. We'd love to pastor. I was so excited. I told my boss. I told my family. I told everyone I knew that uh, moving out of the railroad you know, uh, experience. I was an engineer at that time. I said, we're going to get into full-time ministry. Really, 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 really excited about that. And we found out later that the senior leader was not going to step down. He wasn't going to start a church. But nobody told us that we were disqualified or they didn't need us any longer. So for three days, we sequestered ourselves. We locked ourselves in the house and we looked at each other and we just, we just began to mourn the loss of that, of that promise, that leadership position. 
I know it's not a big deal to you, but when you tell your friends and everyone you know, you tell your family, tell your boss that you're going to be stepping down, you know, it was really a difficult time for us. Church of two or three hundred people. For three days, nobody knew our pain. No one knew our pain. We were waiting for the phone call, for someone to call, someone to knock on the door, someone to be there to just say, listen, we want to commiserate, commiserate with you. We know this must have been really difficult for you. What can we do for you? But no one called. No one knocked. Back then, I don't even know if they even had email back then. It was a lonely time. And when we go through a life crisis, no matter what it might be, a loss of a vision, loss of a dream, loss of a child, loss of our finances, a relationship, whatever it might be, we, we don't like to grieve by ourselves. We don't want to feel like we're alone. Now, there's some of us who choose to do it that way. Not good, but some of us do. But the reality is that we want someone to step in and be with us. We don't want them to do a whole lot of talking. We just want their presence. And I want to share something with you. You know, oftentimes our presence is more important than what we can do, just being there. And I want to just go through the scriptures because I think the Bible teaches us how to extend spiritual care to people as we look at this portion of scripture in the book of Job. We'll find some insights, I think, that can help us. Because there's someone at work that you work with that's probably going through something right now. Maybe you're going through something right now. Maybe your children are. And how do we handle people who are going through difficult issues? How can we be honored to be with someone at the worst time of their life and help them to navigate through that difficult time? We all would love to do that, wouldn't we? To help someone navigate through the most difficult day of their life, just to be with them and minister to them in such a way that they look at us and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. I think that's important. So there is no greater honor. There's no greater, more greater responsibility than to be there for someone on their worst day of their life. But again, we're so scared, we don't know what to say and what to do. So I want to look at a man named Job. Most of you know the book of Job. It's probably one of the oldest books written in the Bible. He probably lived during the time of, right after the time of Adam, some people think. He was a man who experienced an agony of human despair and of desolation, desolation of spirit. We are introduced, are introduced to him in Job 1, verse 2 and 3. Job had seven sons and three daughters, so we know he's a family man. We know he had a loving relationship because the scriptures say that he often would pray for his children. He loved his children, wanted them to walk in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and he would often pray and fast for them. Not only was he a great family man, but we know that he was a great, a great man in the community, and he had great wealth. He owned 7,000 sheep. 3,000 camels, 500 pair of oxen. It reminds me of some women who have 500 pairs of shoes, and forgive me women, I do too, okay? 500 donkeys and a large number of servants. He was the richest person in the East. Now, how would you like to be Job? At this time, I, I think I would. I mean, he had great standing in the community. When he would enter a room, people would stand and they would listen. He had the tongue of the learned. He always had a word for the weary in due season. He was articulate. He was bright. He had great wisdom and counsel. He was rich. He was living the good life. But come on, some of you would like to live the good life, wouldn't you? Uh, thank you for that one no or yes or whatever it was. Yeah. But in rapid concession, succession, he lost everything. You remember the story. In one day, he lost his children. Then he lost his cattle, his sheep, his donkeys, lost everything. Not only that, then the Bible says that he was affl afflicted with a terrible disease. Not only is he grieving the loss of everything he lost, but he's grieving his own health. No longer is he esteemed in the community. In fact, as we go into the book of Job, we realize oftentimes that, as Job said, I used to walk in the room when people stand, and now they sit. The children mock me and laugh at me. I've lost my standing in the community. Everyone thinks that I'm contagious. They don't want to touch me. I don't know about you, but I think it would be really, really, really difficult to lose just one child. In fact, we know what statistics tell us. Usually a family does not even make it. Most families don't even make it through the loss of one child. They usually end in divorce. How do you grieve 10 children at one time? How do you work through that process of grief? I mean, just layers and layers of grief. How do you peel that onion away and, 
and lose seven sons and then three daughters. How, how do you work through that? I mean, when I read this story, I'm thinking, this is just extraordinary to me. How, how, do, you, how do you find yourself in a position like that? What would your response be? What will your raw emotions tell you? You know, what's going on in your life as we think about this man named Job? It, it's just in, incredible to me. His suffering, I mean, just shook his world. Multiple losses can, complement the, can com, uh, complicate excuse me, the ability to grieve effectively. You know, I try to tell people, just grieve one at a time. Just work the first one, then get to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. You, you just can't deal with it all at one time. You've just got to work through your losses one moment at a time. So he was left stunned and numb. There was no chance to say goodbye to his children. And I can only imagine every time we lose a loved one in our life, there's always that grief that comes in. But a lot of times there's a false guilt also, too. I should have, would have, could have. I should have called them. I should have been to their house. I should have said something. He had no time to say goodbye to his children. They were all taken all at one time. He lost everything, even his health and respect in the community. So he's presented with the problem. It's a spiritual challenge to him through what's going on. He was experiencing a serious, serious spiritual crisis. Sometimes even those who are strong in faith, deeply grounded in Christ at times, can struggle with, it, with a spiritual crisis. The common spiritual effects of a crisis can disconnect us with the Lord. We begin to question God. We begin to think about our theological beliefs and we ask ourselves, are they really true? We usually get angry with God. There's a sense of spiritual emptiness. We tend to withdraw from the community of faith and there are people probably, they're not here today, that maybe have gone through a difficult loss and because of their struggle with their theology and maybe with their understanding of God are no longer a part of this fellowship. Statistics say that a lot of people leave the church every year. It's a terrible thing. So maybe we can look at God's word and find some instructions and in what we need to do, because we want to be on a mission of compassion. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Job 2, 11 and 13, it said, When Job's three friends heard of all this evil that come upon him, they came each from his own place. Now, I like what the passage says here in the English version, English Standard Version. It says here, when they heard about all the evil that came upon him, they recognized that there was something serious that was taking place in Job's life. And what really touched me about it was that they were willing to go. I don't know where they met, where they congregated, but somehow they came from afar. It could have been a week before they, they got the message that he lost everything. It could have been another week before they got to Job. But the reality, somehow, they made an effort to be present. And I want you to think about that. They made an effort to be present in his pain. That's what Jesus has done in our life, that he has come to be present in our pain. While we were yet sinners, God demonstrated his love for us, that he sent his son to die in our place. While we were yet in our pain, Christ came and entered our human frailty. That's extraordinary to me. And so what I want to share with you is that people really need people to enter into their pain. As I alluded to earlier, when we lost that position as, uh, as leadership, we wanted someone to say, you know, we want to empathize with you. We want to show compassion. We want to, want to express to you our feelings that, yes, this probably really hurt you and you probably feel betrayed. We just some, want someone to validate our loss. We don't want them to take it for granted. I remember when I lost my father. I was in the hospital in Roseville. And uh, he passed away that morning. And as he did, I, I went to a restaurant. And the restaurant was noisy as all restaurants were. And I felt like standing up and saying, would you please stop? Would you grieve with me? I just lost my father. But they kept eating. They kept talking. And the noise seemed to get louder and louder and louder and louder. I wanted them to enter into my pain. I know that wasn't right. I know everybody can't just stop and get off the bus and worry about me. But I'm hoping there's three friends out there that would. Two friends, one friend. I know Jesus does. But even when I think about that, I realize there's just something about human companionship. That sometimes God says that's what we need, sometimes more than anything else. 
And God created the world perfect, a perfect environment, a perfect father created Adam. And God saw a frown on Adam's face. He had a right relationship with God, close, close, but the intimacy of a human being was missing. And God says, it's not good for man to be alone. Hear me now. It's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for us or a brother or sister in Christ to be alone when they're going through a, a tragedy, a calamity. And we are afforded the ability to be the presence of God in the midst of people's pain. And that's what we want to talk about for the next few minutes, and then we'll go into one more thing. So it says they heard this, they came, and, and it says they made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, notice this, they did not recognize him. It just talks about the severity and the deformity of his body because of his disease. So here's a man trying to mourn the loss of everything he possessed, everything he knew. It defined who he was. It was all taken in the moment. And now his body is racked with severe pain. Why does God have this story here in the Bible? Because I think he wants us to understand how we need to minister to people when they go through the worst day of their life. That somehow we need to be with them. And they raised their voices and they wept. They com commiserated with Job. The Bible says to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. We need to do that. And they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. I mean, there, it was a symbolic gesture of mourning. They entered into his pain. They entered into his mourning. You know, Sadly, with any size of any church, sometimes people are going through something, and because we don't know what they're going through, you know, they think that we're ignoring them. But a lot of times, we don't know what's going on in their life, and so we don't bother the call. But as a pastor for 25 years, I know people have left, and they said, George, the reason we left is because we lost our son or our daughter, and no one called us. Well, my first response was, if I knew, I would have. But that's not going to bring them comfort during that time. I just allow them to express their, their pain and realize, Lord, help us to do a better job to know what our members are going through. That's why it's important for you to fill out a prayer request. As you do, people on the prayer chain get to know who you are and know what you're going through. And being on the prayer chain myself and getting some of your prayer requests, I know that some of you are going through some difficult times. Some of you have been diagnosed with cancer. Some of you have been fighting cancer for some time. Some of you are even hungry. There are people who are hungry in our fellowship. People are going through a broken relationship or their children have gone awry. You know, and it's just so neat to know that these things are happening, that we can pray for you. But more than that, we need to do more that if you give us the opportunity, we can call you if you put your name down on that piece of paper. See, we are part of a family. The Bible says that God sets, you know, the solitude in families. Many of us are just out there by ourselves. We're just orphans looking for a home. And this is your spiritual home at this time. And we're responsible for one another because we're a big family. And sometimes the pastoral staff can't do all the counseling, can't do all the visiting. And that's why it's great just to turn the body loose in this ministry called spiritual care. So important that we do that. So as we look at this for a moment, <clears throat> for they saw that he was suffering very great. And one thing I want you to know, people in crisis that are hurting, they usually crave a safe and comforting presence of others. And that's what spiritual care requires, the ministry of presence. And this is so incredible to me, to be the loving presence of Jesus. And because Jesus lives in you, wherever you go, you take him with you. And as I alluded to earlier, that when Abraham, I mean, excuse me, when Noah, I mean, Abraham was in the garden, he, he needed a physical presence. It's nice to know that God is here in the spirit, but it's nice to know that there's somebody there that you can touch. And they can touch you and pray for you as an expression of God's love. There are times where I minister to people and I'm with people that tell me, you know, God is, is departed from me. He's nowhere to be found. And I say, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not true. Well, why do you say that, George? Because I'm here. I'm here. I represent God. God has not forgotten you. That's why I'm here. 
His presence dwells within me. I am symbolically his hands and feet, and so are you. Wherever you go, you need to remind people that God has not forsaken them because you're there. You represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. How cool is that? You know, I, I walk into a place and everybody's cussing and drinking and everything. And I walk in and poof, everybody shuts up, you know. I, you know, they try to hide their cigarettes and their beer from me, you know, and they shut their mouth up. What, what is that? You know, am I a cop? You know, am I going to bust them? No, it's just the presence of God at times in my life. You know what I'm saying. Say something just to know that you're alive out there, okay? Say, oh me, oh my, or whatever, you know, just let me know you're out there. But, you know, there's just, just something about you walk in and, you know, your family knows you're a Christian. They all try to hide their stuff. And you don't have to hide your stuff. I'm not here to judge you, you know, but, but just your presence does something. And that's what's cool. God lives inside us and he sends us out into the world to represent him. How cool is that? We're just looking for broken people as Jesus was when he came. The woman caught in adultery. Yeah just showed up at the right time. Just his presence of grace and goodness to her radically changed her life. A woman came up to him one day having an issue of blood. She was unclean. She shouldn't even have been in public and she grabs his robe. Jesus just showed up and ministered to her. During that time, a guy came and said, my child is, is laying in bed, nearly died, and it did die. And Jesus showed up and his presence brought comfort. You're his presence. You can bring comfort. You don't have to be intimidated when someone's going through some difficult times. Just show up. And if you don't show up, then you can't be his presence. So he'll find someone else. Oh, say, oh, me. Okay, you won't say, oh, me. Say, oh, my. Oh, my. oh good. All right. Thank you. We just need to talk. Hi, my name is George. I like you. Okay. And I... <laughs> I I hope you like me too. But we visibly demonstrate God's presence in a tangible way. I want you to know that, how powerful your presence really is. Ministry of presence is primarily about being rather than doing, and, and that's important for us. It's more about being than doing, because you're thinking, what can I do? You don't have to do anything. If you do anything, just say, can I get you some water? You know, usually when people are in tragedy, they're not thinking straight, you know, and their mouth is dry and parched. Just, can I get you some water? But it's more about being than doing. And so that takes off a lot of pressure off me. I'm not there to fix them, but I'm there to tell them, I'll accompany you through your pain. And that's what's so great. We, we, we can't fix them, but we can demonstrate that I'll be with you. And that's important that we do that. They need to know that we're not there to fix them. And this is the problem that we find here with Job's friends. They were doing so, so good when they kept their mouth shut for seven days. And then they turn out to be Larry, Moe, and Curly. You know, they, uh, they became the Three Stooges. They really did. And that's what's tragic. And we'll look at that as we continue in this portion of Scripture. But a comforting presence. I remember when I, I had a struggle with my son. He ended up getting his girlfriend pregnant. Now, think about this now. He's 17 years old. She's 16. And I'm a pastor of a, a big church, a growing church. At that time, the largest church in Amador County. And I share that because I, I had some reputation there. And all of a sudden, my, my son gets his girlfriend pregnant. Fortunately, they married and they've given us four kids and he's in the ministry today. But that was a difficult time in my life. And I didn't know where to turn to. You know, I resigned, told the board I'm done. I disqualified myself. I couldn't raise my kid for God. You know, the guilt, false guilt was all there. And so I called my dad. I thought I'd find comfort there. I said, Dad, I, I need you. He said, Yeshua got his girlfriend pregnant, and my dad's first word said, why didn't he use contraceptives? I said, Dad, thank you, and hung up. I was so broken. My world fell apart. I mean, it fell apart. Those years of ministry, what God was doing in the church, you know, my son, his future. And I called my dad for help. Instead of just listening and saying, son, I'll be there. He wanted to correct me for not teaching my kid how to use contraceptives. Life is painful, and when you lose something deep in your life, 
you hope that the ministry of presence would be there. Just people without any judgment on you. Allow you to express your feelings and emotions, though they're raw. You know, and allow you just to vent. Because sometimes that's the greatest thing when somebody's going through loss, is just to give them the privilege of venting without judging them. One thing I have come to realize in the church as I pastored for some 30, 25 years, maybe longer than that, really. But oftentimes we're program-driven instead of people-driven. You know, we have these programs for people, but reality, we just need to realize sometimes programs cannot touch people the way that just a relationship can. We're in relationship. Really, this is what's so unique about Christianity. You know, we're not dictated by some ritual, if you would, or some codes of conduct. Uh, there's a way to live, we know that, but it's not these rules. It's a relationship. Let's just come together, and let's work through life together in God. And let's be there for one another. And we want to look at that in a few moments again, too. So we don't arrive with an agenda. We're not there to save them, but rather to come alongside them wherever they're at. And I think that's important. And up to this time, Job's friends were what? Doing pretty good. We'd give them an A+, plus, right? They came a long ways. They invested their time and their talent to be there with them. You know, they sacrificed their own family life. You know, they worked that distance. I don't know how long it took. It could have been a week or two. I mean, they'd paid a price to be there, and everything was going well. And then something happened. The second thing we need to do is not only to be a loving presence, but to be a compassionate listener. If you get only two things, because your presence is God's gift to those people you come in contact with. Your presence is God's gift to them. I want you to realize that. So we need to provide for spiritual needs through availability, through presence, and also through listening. Because if we're not there, we can't be God's presence. So our availability, our presence, and our listening are three key things we need to get if we're going to be successful ministering to hurting people. So we need people in our life who are willing to listen to our pain and hear our struggles. A good listener, really, is a rare gift of God. And I know that I'm trying to practice that with my children and my grandchildren, and even with my wife at times, because, you know, I have all the answers. I want to fix everyone. You know, I'm the spiritual guy in the house. Yeah, right. You know, I got all the Bible verses. I can shoot Bible bullets at them. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? You know, uh, the spiritual cliches. I got them all. I got, oh, man. Oh, you're going through that? I got it. Here, 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 here. You know. <laughs> and they're more wounded than they were before I even got there, you know. So we need to provide a safe environment, and I need to do that with my children oftentimes because I always think that I need to correct them. You know, even with my grandkids recently, they tell me things I'm thinking, that's the stupidest thing. I can't wait till you stop talking because I'm going to fix it. But I realize that that's not a good listener because I have an agenda instead of having a compassionate ear. And there's chances and opportunities for us to talk later when they're able to share their feelings, but maybe they're just tempting me and testing me to see if I'm judgmental or critical or I'm just going to go ahead and respond like my dad did. Why didn't you, you know? We need to get people to talk, but we need to wait for them to talk. So Job thought he could share his feelings. I mean, the guys came a long distance, three of them. They're sitting down with Job in sackcloth and ashes. They're mourning. They're seeing the evil in his life. He thought, this is a safe, safe environment. I'm just going to share my raw emotions. So just think about this. He just lost 10 children, lost everything. How raw was his emotions going to be when he first opened up his mouth? What do you think? You think we're going to be real spiritual? Mm, no, no, they weren't. Notice this in Job 3.1. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job said, let the day perish on which I was born in the night that said a man is conceived. You know, he said, forget that day when my dad wanted to hand out cigars. Forget that day. Forget that day on the calendar. I wish I was never born. The thing that I fear the most has come upon me, Job says. So why is light given to him who's in misery and life to the bitter in soul? What do we know about Job in this passage here? He was in misery, right? 
And his life was in bitter, bitterness of soul. He was really struggling. And, and we could at least say, yeah, we understand that. We would feel that way too. I mean, I get a flat tire and I think my whole world fell apart. Where was God, you know? Oh, where was God? Verse 23, why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? I mean, he just felt like he was a target of God. Why is light given to those who have no future, he tells us, in the new living? Those God, those God has surrounded with difficulties. I mean, this was a traumatic event. This was extraordinary in his life. Under these conditions, he says, life is not really worth living. And you know what that's like. There's times in your life you think, Lord, I just can't handle it anymore. He was struggling spiritually. And I'll tell you why he was. Because the theology at that time was the law of divine retribution. If you sin, God would punish you. If you were good, God would bless you. And his whole life was indicative of that. He was walking upright before the Lord and God was extremely blessing him. But all of a sudden his theology begins to change now. Sometimes it does as we begin to walk with God. We see some things differently. You know, we no longer major on the minors. Maybe we start majoring on the majors. You know, things look a little different. And so he's working through this, this theology of divine retribution. He's thinking in his heart, Father, I have not done anything worth this judgment. I mean, he tells us later on, he says, I made a covenant with my eye. I won't look upon a woman. So we know he, he wasn't dealing with lustful thoughts. He goes on and tells us, if I had committed adultery with my wife, let other men lay with her. So he did commit adultery. So he's working through his theology, and it's really difficult when you're in the midst of crisis that you're thinking, this just doesn't make sense. What I've read and what I'm, just doesn't make sense. And sometimes we need to work through that. And we need to allow people to work through that at times because we know inevitably they're gonna regain their faith and they're gonna gain a greater perspective as Job did at the very end of his life. So he's not conscious of any wrongdoing. And he sees no justice in what's taking place in his life. So he's struggling spiritually, but his friends are struggling religiously. They are. And what, in essence, what they're feeling, saying, Job, Job, what you're saying is, if you didn't commit sin, then God is unjust because he's punished you unjustly. And they said, we, we can't handle that. We, we just can't handle that. And so there's a theological battle, uh, battle going on. You say you're not guilty, but if you say you're not guilty, then you say that God's unjust, and we don't think God's unjust, so we think you're guilty. So the whole relationship begins to change. From mourners, they became murderers. Well, they didn't actually kill him, but they were trying to take the very life, the last of the little life he had out of him. And we want to be mourners. We don't want to be murderers. We, we, we don't want to get in a theological debate when people are suffering. There'll be a time for that. The scriptures will bring comfort in time. But at this time, he was working through this. So as Job is, is telling his friends this, Job is saying, I don't realize what I've done. And his friends are telling him, there must be a reason why God is destroying your life. Now, how would you like to be there in that position? You just lost your children again. You're mourning them. You're mourning your health. You're mourning the loss. And your friends are saying, you and your relationship with God are out of sorts. We know the story. We know that it wasn't true, that he was in right relationship with God. Job didn't know what was going on behind the scenes, the battle between God and Satan over Job's life. But for someone to tell you that, that the reason why you've lost your son or your daughter, in fact, they go on and say that. These guys go on and say that, that your kids probably had sin in their life. That's why God killed them. How would you like to be taught like that or talked to like that when you just lost a kid? Well, God took your kid because he was a bad kid and God killed him. Or even the other side of it. Well, God needed your baby more than you. Tell a young mother that and see how she feels. Those are things that we don't want to share, right? Those why sometimes why we just run from people who are struggling because we don't know what to say. If you don't know what to say, don't say anything. You're not there to do. You're there to be, just to be the presence of God. Job 16, 12. I was enjoying a quiet, peaceful life. This is the new uh, easy-to-read version. 
But then God crushed me. Yes, he took me by the neck and he broke me into pieces. He has made me his target. Survivors say a lot of things out of their emotional place. When they're working through their trauma we see here and they lose everything, their wide range of emotions just come pouring out. And they will say some things about God that you know that they don't believe, but it's just because of their pain they're expressing that. So how do we respond to these raw emotions? You know, how do we do that? It's so important that we do, because if we don't do it well, we can contribute to a long-term impact on their lives. We need to hear their pain, and we need to validate them and walk with them. We need to. I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. It's a difficult time in your life, and you're wondering where God's at. I hear what you're saying. Just to validate that. Not to say, well, you know that's not true. God loves you. You know, it's hard for someone sometimes in the midst of losing 10 children to believe that God really loves them. Would you say, would you agree to that? Yeah, so we just work them through. We know that sooner or later they're going to come to a realization that God still loves them in the midst of that and he had something going on in doing something behind the scenes for Job. So we need to be accepting and non-judgmental. I think it's the key. It's not a time for theological lessons. Survivors will correct their theology over time. So I talked about shooting Bible bullets at them. We don't want to do that. So his friends felt he was suffering because it was self-induced. Again, the law of a retribution. The minister's presence has nothing to do with having all the right answers to any questions because I've learned over the years, we don't get answers from a lot of our questions. It's not what happened. The reality is now what? What do we do now after the loss of a child, our job? Our marriage. Now what? It's not why it happened, but now what do we do? It's so important that we move in that area. So here's the big no-nos that Job's friends committed, given a lot of advice. In fact, it's almost 40 chapters of them giving Job advice, and it didn't help Job one bit. Again, explaining theological concepts, trying to correct what was faulty, they thought, in his theology. He wanted spiritual care. He didn't want spiritual platitudes. He wanted uh, compassionate listeners. And that really helps me. Look in Job 19, 1 through 3. Then Job answered and said, How long will you torment me and break me into pieces with words? Get that. That's a no-no. Man, when we're attacking those who are suffering with words, no matter how theologically sound they seem, the sufferer feels that that's an attack. And that he says that you break me with with your words. These 10 times you've cast reproach upon me. Are you not ashamed to wrong me? They started off so well, and they became the three stooges, as I alluded to earlier. Our presence is not ministry if we're not wanted. If there's no compassion, no understanding, then we don't need to show up. It's better that we don't than to show up and hurt someone who's suffering. Job 16, one through two, then Job answered and said, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. You've got to underline that one. Miserable comforters are you all? Do you get that? Oh, man. Have you ever met a miserable comforter? Okay, I will. Yeah, thank you. I see one hand back there. I see that hand. Thank you. Two of us, have, three of us have experienced some miserable comforters. You know. It reminds me of what went on today around the church this morning. I was a photographer once. We had, I had my own studio, Love Story Photography, and I was shooting the wedding, and my, my strobe went out. And a young brother of the church came up, and he said, what's the problem? He said, you look frustrated. I said, well, I am frustrated. My strobe broke. I'm in a wedding. It's dark out. It's dark in this building here. I'm, I'm supposed to take wedding pictures. I, I can't ask him to come back the next day. He said, George, you should have the victory. God's in the midst of all this, you know. Miserable comforter. George, can I... Can I find a battery for you? Huh. Can I light some candles? Oh, you should have the victory. God's in the midst of all this. All things work together for good that that love God. That was the last thing I wanted to hear. I wanted to beat the guy up so bad, you know. I just, it was just like, are you kidding? I'm just going to ruin their wedding. I don't have a strobe to go off. I'm shooting everything in the dark. Oh, well, miserable comforter. No matter, regardless of his motives, you know, he became a greater part of my trial that day. Miserable comforters. We don't want to do that, do we? And you've never done that, right? You've never been a miserable comforter, right? You never. 
told people stupid things, have you? Of course not. Not this church. People down the street are her due, but not, not this one. No one wants to be known as a miserable comforter. You know, so as we see here, we don't arrive with an agenda to save them, but rather we come alongside them whenever and wherever we find them. We visibly display God's presence in a tangible way. So I just want to close with one more verse. There's so much I could share, but let's look at Galatians 6.2, if we can throw that up on the screen. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. I love Paul sharing this. Prior to that, he talked about if you catch a brother in a sin, you know, go to him in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself. And then he goes on to say, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is only mentioned twice in the Bible. No one has a definitive answer to what that really means. The conclusion really is, is that it's the law of love. So he tells us as spiritual caregivers on a ministry of compassion that we're to bear one another's burdens. I love that, a support ministry of spiritual care. The word bear implies carrying something with endurance that we need to endure. And his friends did that. They came a long ways to endure again his pain. It means to sustain, to uphold, to support. And there are many people in the church who have burdens, and we're there to uphold their burdens, it says here. And what is a burden? Well, it could be anything, any heaviness in their life, any weight any trouble that they're going through. We have an obligation, we have a responsibility, we have a duty to help unburden others. Isn't that great though? It's a great responsibility, but it's pretty cool when we do that. So what are the basic tools for spiritual care? Just being there, remember that. When you don't know what to say, don't say anything. Just be there, don't have an agenda, but make sure you have time to listen, being present and offering support. I'll just close with the story today at one I was asked to officiate at a celebration of life for a gentleman I just met a couple months ago. His faith is a lot different than mine, but for whatever reason, God hooked us up. And I was able just to be with him as he was in the last segment of his life, the last stage of his life. And we just began to be great friends and just using these simple tools of just being present and a compassionate listener, you know, asking him a little bit about his belief, his traditions and so forth and so on. And working through them, not judging them, not trying to correct them. You know, I did have an opportunity to share a little bit with them before he passed about my faith, and what I believe that God has for every one of us. But what really moved me was this, that he just told me, he said, George, I love you. And then his wife and his five daughters said, would you please come? Would you open up the service? Would you share your experience that you had with our beloved? And would you use a Christian prayer to start the service off. I am so honored. I am so honored in life at times when people ask me to do that. And I think God wants that to be so common in every one of our lives, is that people will realize when things get rough, they want you there. Because you're not there to judge, you're not there to fix, you're there to walk them through it. With what? A loving presence and listening ears. What if we all do that? What if you start doing that in the workplace, at school, maybe even at home with your husband or wife or with your children? What if we get to be known, you know, in a, maybe in our setting at work, our sphere of influence, that people say, you know, they're, they're going through a hard time, but, you know, we should call George or Frank or Sue or Bonnie. We should call them. And we know that they'll sit and listen. They'll commiserate. They'll work them through that grief. What would that happen? What happens if I would do that? What happens if we all do that in this community this next week or two? Because we're going to hear about pain. We're just say, hey, I'm going to call them. I'm going to go visit them. I'm just going to be there. What if we do that? How awesome would that be? And I think that would put a big smile on God's face. Because when you show up, he shows up. And you express his love to them. So, Father, thank you that Christianity is more than dogma and doctrine. It's more than tradition or rituals. It really is a relationship with you and with your son and with the dying world who is struggling. As you sent your son in the world 2,000 years ago, you're sending us now. Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. I send you now into the world. Lord, and oftentimes we think we have need to have our theology together. 
that somehow we need to have some experience in, in biblical truths, but really what we need to be is just present and have a listening ear. And Lord, we just thank you for the opportunities that you're going to afford us because, Lord, you don't share things with us without us beginning to put it into practice. So we're going to hear of some things going on in the next few weeks. And may this message come back to these people to know that their presence is God's gift to those that you send them to. Help us, we pray, and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Help me. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, that's an old song. Huh? We don't hear that much anymore unless you're in the King James Version. Huh? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his countenance. May the Lord be gracious to you. As I often say, may he be with you as you go out and come back in again. Let's stand. We have our prayer team up in front. If you need prayer, please come. If not, you're released to what? To be presence in someone's life today. A compassionate presence, all right? Leave your judgmentalness here at the altar, your criticism, and just go love. Go love some people. 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 God bless you. Henry.